Welcome back to Intesa San Paolo On Air, the English language insight series jointly hosted by Intesa San Paolo and the University of Oxford, where we embark on global conversations with global leaders. My name is Rupert Younger, and in this episode, we explore a very human condition, the quest for status and how the visible display of wealth, which I will occasionally refer to as bling, has played an important part in this quest over many centuries. My name is Michael Jensen. I'm a professor of strategy at the University of Michigan uh, in the US. Uh, I'm also an international research fellow at the Center for Corporate Reputation at Oxford University. So status is, is one of these, I would call it a, a human universal. It's something that we all care deeply about whether or not we would uh, admit to it. So uh, if we think about what, what status is, uh, status is basically a position in a social system. It's, it's often what we would call the hierarchical position or ranked uh, position. And, and, and status is, is interesting because it's associated with a lot of expectations, rights, and, and privileges. And it's one of those things that uh, we as humans use to, to make sense of, of the, the social world we, we live in. So when you think about it, pretty much all aspects of your life has been ranked in, in one way or another. Michael Jensen is a leader within academia studying how status works and why it is so valuable in human society today. I asked him why it is so valuable. Part of the reason is that our life is chaotic, right? The, the, the environment around us is chaotic. We need simple and efficient mechanisms to sort all the stimuli we get into to different buckets. And, and status is one of the way uh, we do it. What I find so compelling about Michael's thinking is that I am led to a simple truth that status has mattered to us as humans throughout history. It's not just a modern phenomenon, something powered by the digital age that we now live in. It seems clear to me that if our societies are ones where we are judged in comparison to others, whether that be by our wealth, by our breeding or by our jobs, then this is a fundamentally human condition that has existed for millennia. And in particular, I'm fascinated by the way in which ostentation, visible displays of wealth, has been one of the main building blocks through which status is built. Intrigued by the idea of bling in ancient societies, I turn to Paul Roberts at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford to kick us off. I am Paul Roberts. I am the research keeper in the Department of Antiquities at the Ashmolean Museum of Art and Archaeology in Oxford University. If you had money in the Roman world, you showed you had money. It was a society that was largely built on power. The Roman Empire was about power. And indeed, you, you could display your power in various ways. But ostentation, showing that you had the wealth to do things, buy things, build things, was a very important part of ostentation. It was, of course, not just money that mattered. Money was a vehicle that was used to create permanent memorials, temples, important buildings, all of which carried your name. Possibly the, the, the best example of this ostentation through architecture is the Colosseum. Now, the Colosseum in Rome is built by two emperors in between about 70 and 80 AD. And the Emperor Vespasian, the Emperor Titus, father, son, they put down quite savagely um, the Jewish revolt. They sack Jerusalem, they sack the Temple of Jerusalem, and they bring home the gold. This gold that is brought to Rome amounted to a colossal amount of money, and what the emperor and his conquering generals do with it is very significant. Until that point, Rome had no amphitheatre of any size, so they decide to build the greatest amphitheatre that the world has ever seen, and they decide to build it on the site of the great golden pool of Nero. In doing this, they have in one masterstroke awed the populace, instilled a sense of civic pride 
and bolstered their status, naming it the Amphitheater Flavium, which is the family name of the Emperor Vespasian and his son, the Emperor Titus. It literally becomes a status signal across the ages. It's about keeping your stamp on the city. For as long as that monument stands, it will have your name attached to it. It was not only the final building that mattered, that celebrated your wealth and power and influence, but also the way in which it was built. Paul Roberts again, this time talking about the Basilica of Maxentius at the top of the Roman Forum. The Basilica of Maxentius includes six colossal, and we're talking 60 feet or so, columns of white marble. To move these columns, it's been estimated that you would have dozens of pairs of oxen. That would be the only way to move this column. That means for a prolonged period, you would have had this incredible wagon train of oxen dragging these immense columns through the city. Everyone would have seen the process of building it. So not only do you get awed by the finished product, even the building of it shows your immense wealth and power. Visible displays of wealth were also vitally important inside the home, most especially when you were entertaining. It's the second century BC when Rome really expands throughout the Mediterranean. And what it does as it expands is it conquers areas, cities, and willingly or unwillingly, the wealth and know-how and skilled artisans and craftsmen and slaves of those peoples come to Rome and to Italy. And colossal wealth flows into Rome. Conquests were always followed by a triumph, which was a majestic procession through the streets of Rome where the conquests, human and physical, were shown off to the citizens. Cart after cart of treasures laden with gold, sculptures, silks, marble tables and so on were then auctioned off to citizens. And it was these items that appeared across Roman high society, bought by the wealthiest and most powerful families, who would display what they have bought to show, of course, just how cultured they were, but also to show just how proud they were to be Roman. By having a piece of sculpture in your house that came from the sack of Corinth or came from the sack of Carthage, you in one fell swoop will wow your guests. But also, you are showing that I back the regime, in effect. You can say this is from our glorious conquest of Corinth. And so you can show your credentials as a good Roman. This was not just a feature of Roman society. Wealthy Romans travelled to their country homes and with them they brought their bling, the trappings of wealth that would signal to their neighbours in the country just how wealthy and powerful and, of course, high status they were. Pretty much like what you see in the country houses outside London in the home counties or outside New York in the Hamptons today. My name's Jo Berry and I am an ancient historian, a professor of ancient history at Swansea University. And... Um, I have spent much of my career studying Pompeii in particular. Um, that's, my, that's my passion. That's uh, where my family are from originally as well. So I've been going out there since I was a kid. And um, yeah, I like to share that passion with other people as much as I can. I asked Professor Berry how we know that people living in Rome and Pompeii cared about visual displays of wealth. Well, we know that they cared about visual displays of wealth because we have literary sources that tell us that they cared. Um, and most of these literary sources are actually quite moralising as well. So they are all about, oh, my goodness, so-and-so's got marble columns in his house. This is absolutely outrageous. What a waste of time. What a waste of money. Um, you know, we shouldn't be doing things like this. But, you know, behind that is the implication that actually everybody wants to do this. Everybody is trying to do this. This is how they're spending the wealth of empire. Um, and then there are these crusty old men who basically are getting very upset about this. So we know about this as a phenomenon uh, from about the second century BC onwards. 
Um, and then we see it in some of the archaeological remains that we have, both from Rome, but also uh, from places like Pompeii and the Bay of Naples, where you've got lots of um, luxury villas as well. Um, lots of Romans would come down to the Bay of Naples. They would build their luxury villas. They would fill them with artworks and mosaics and wall paintings, um, you know, fabulous gardens, for example. Um, and and all of those, you know, those sorts of things still still we can still see them today i find it so fascinating that even back then there were those with wealth and those who complained about the visual displays of wealth around them the vulgarity of wealth we could be having exactly the same conversations today about hedge fund managers and other wealthy individuals splashing the cash on some tasteless furniture or garish bling if you are an upright roman citizen you ought to behave in a certain way. And, um, you know, the fear is that with the influx of wealth from empire, with the exposure to um, Greek customs, for example, Greek influences, Greek education, things like that, um, that this is changing Rome. Um, This is changing people, you know, the people in Rome. They're not behaving like traditional Romans used to behave. Um, They're becoming more effeminate. For example, they might be, you know, kind of um, plucking their beards or they might be wearing uh, fancier clothes or they might be bathing too much. That's a big one that kind of comes comes out. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of fear, a lot of conservatism, a lot of worry about change. And that is something that we see today, isn't it? You know, in general, many people are uncomfortable with the idea of change. One great example is Trimalchio, Petronius's fictional character that embodied all the fears of the upper classes about a person who was not spending their money in the proper way. So what sort of flash or bling might we have seen back then? It turns out that one of the most high status things that would have set you apart back then is to have mosaics. Just think, you know, um, how long it must have taken to make one of these, how expensive it must have been to do it, and how, therefore, that must have set you apart from your neighbours, you know, in terms of your resources and your wealth and your your ability to to be able to um to to acquire something like this. Um, So those, those for me, the mosaics, I think, are really, really, really special. Then there would have been many, many servants. The more you have, the higher your perceived status, all doing specific jobs. Then there would have been the type of food, and then there would have been the silver service that you're eating off. What do we know about this? The best example of that would be the uh, Villa of the Papyri just outside of Herculaneum. You know, I mean, we know it because, or most people know it, I guess, because of all of the, the carbonized papyri that were found inside but one of the uh, well, one of the other really noticeable things that was found in in this huge villa were um the sculptures you know the statues and they are bronze statues which are really expensive um and then also um, marble statues as well and there are a few of those that do seem to be greek in origin not all of them but um there do seem to be some that are much older uh, so yeah so you know this villa it's it it is the biggest villa in the whole region that has been discovered. Okay, so th- this is probably owned by somebody super wealthy at Rome who's coming down for um, the holidays. And yeah, you're right, they've decorated it the way that they want it um, to be, with, you know, and they've brought things with them. Paul Roberts of the Ashmolean also offers a perspective on this. You've been invited to dinner in a wealthy house in Rome, or Pompeii, or London, or Naples, any Roman city. And the guest has invited you for a reason. He might like you. He might want your company for dinner. But chances are he either wants to impress you so that you will want to be part of his clientela, or you might be somebody whose clientela he wants to be part of. But either way, the dinner party is useful. And they've already come through the atrium through the entrance hall, that public private space where you would wow any arriving guests with beautiful Greek style wall paintings, mosaics. You might have busts of your ancestors showing your pedigree. That was very important. Wealth alone is great and wealth can get you 
can get you status, but it will never in itself get you pedigree. And it really was all about the bling, the ostentation, the show of just how successful you had been. In the Roman times, if I turned the plate over, the silver plate, I might have seen the name of the owner, or I might have seen the name of a previous owner, because it's very clear that silver service sets get sold on and broken up and reassembled. What I'd see is perhaps their name or somebody else's name, but very importantly, I'd see the weight of the silver plate in pounds and ounces, because you are proclaiming all the time your wealth. It is literally the family silver there on the table. So if being wealthy did not by itself guarantee pedigree, could it guarantee status? No, it doesn't at all, does it? I mean, if you just look at, again, the story of Trimalchio, um, he is a freedman and he is super wealthy. And there are, yes, there are lots of people who want to suck up to him uh, because, you know, lots of people can benefit from his wealth if he's going to you know, patronise them. Um, but he's never going to be a politician. He's never going to be a magistrate. Um, he's never going to be accepted into the higher echelons of society. Um, and this is something that he knows too. Um, and this is actually also one of the, I think, one of the really interesting things about looking at houses in Pompeii as well is that, you know, there are few, there are some really big houses um, and there are some really nicely decorated houses and there are houses where, the, you know, the nice things have been found in. We've got mosaics and the wall paintings and the statues and things like this, but we have no idea who lived in them. Um, as much as, you know, you might read in some of the textbooks that whatever house was owned by this person, um, that's just a guess, you know, and quite often on, on the basis of quite weak evidence. So, um, yeah, you know, th we don't know whether the people living in the biggest houses in Pompeii were upper class Romans or whether they were upstart wealthy freedmen. So if wealth alone was not enough to guarantee status, what else could one do back in the day to make it? So much of this kind of activity is recorded in inscriptions that are permanent, you know, on the buildings that people have bought, uh, built or um, contributed towards, you know, I mean, for example, you just take the amphitheatre, for example. Um, firstly, we've got inscriptions telling us who built it. Then we've got inscriptions telling us who kind of um, rebuilt it after the earthquake that Pompeii suffered. Um, and then we've also got um, inscriptions that tell us which magistrates built particular sections of seating. Um, and these are always there for people to see. You know, every time you walked into the amphitheatre, you would see some of those inscriptions. So um, that is absolutely deliberate. This is really about, you know, underlining um, who the most important families are. This all sounds very contemporary, with aristocratic families naming buildings to new money endowing academic posts and the like. Would we, as 21st century humans, feel very much at home in Pompeii, recognising the advertising, branding and social behaviours surrounding us? We'd recognise some aspects of that. I mean, I, I can't say that we'd recognise it all. I imagine it would feel fairly alien to us. But, you know, there are there are definitely the practices around euergotism. Um, and I always kind of think um, that perhaps these are uh, things that you see more in America today than you do see than you see in Britain. You know, this idea, um, thinking about American universities, for example, where whole buildings and facilities have been donated by particular families who might have been might be alumni, for example, of that that university. Um, I mean, there are a few examples of that sort of thing in Britain as well. I mean, you know, look at the Sackler Museum, uh, the um, sorry, the Sackler Library in. Oxford, for example, is a good you know, that's a good example of that. Today we use status as a sense-making mechanism. Status immediately explains hierarchies that exist all around us. I came back to Michael Jensen, our status professor from Michigan, to explain. So when you enter into a, a, a setting with a, with a new uh, set of people you have never interacted with before, so you don't really know what the what the, the reputation is necessarily. But but there is a clear sense of a status hierarchy within the, the room. So um, there's some you know people in, in the room that might be the, the CEO. There's some people that might be uh, the vice president and, and so on and, and, and so forth. So alone by these kind of simple status status stratification, you can immediately begin to interact. 
And this is where, of course, and, and I hope we'll talk about this this later, right? That we begin to also look at, at what what a seemingly silly uh, signal. So the clothes you're wearing, right? The car you arrived in, uh, if you have an entourage, right? The, the size of, of, of that. It strikes me that status and reputation might in this respect be quite similar, which made me start thinking about whether you can be low status but have a high reputation and vice versa. Michael Jensen. This is where it's important to think about the difference between status and reputation. Where status, as I mentioned before, is simply a position in a social system, often a hierarchical position. Reputation is, is more complex. Reputation, that's a prediction of future behavior that is based on how I have experienced your behavior in the past or how other people have witnessed your behavior in, in, in the past. That is much more attribute specific. This is familiar territory to me, as reputation is what I have spent many years researching. And Michael is, of course, spot on. You have a reputation for something with someone, which is different to status, which, of course, is a hierarchy. I don't know what your reputation is for cooking. I've, I've never heard about your, your ability to cook. I've never heard about your skill. I've never experienced it. Um, but if I knew, for instance, that you are a member of a culinary club, a prestigious culinary society, then my expectation to your cooking would immediately be very high. I don't need to know uh, uh, your, 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 uh, your, your specific reputation. I don't need to have experienced your past performance. I have an expectation to you based on the status, your membership of, of uh, this society. For the record, Michael, if you're listening, I am not a member of any culinary society and I would not recommend coming round to my house for a home-cooked meal by me. Michael is a professor in a business school, so I asked him how status works in the world of business. He pointed out, of course, that we rank companies all the time, but he also made the intriguing observation that status is relative to the peer group. If an industry is high status, you can be a low-status company but highly attractive because you operate in a high-status industry. So, is status transferable? So, if you're sta high status in one area, well, then, if I know nothing else about you, then I can take my expectation for how you have performed in, 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 in that uh, particular area, and, and then I can use that to make an assessment of you in, in, in the, the new area. In ancient Rome, status followed wealth and power. Fast forward to today, is it the same? I think, I mean, the, the good news is that, that, that good old-fashioned, you know, performance is, is important, right? Delivering on what is expected of you is, is critical. So I like to think of it as wherever you are now, <clears throat> let's say you have entered into a profession recently and you like to move up in the hierarchy, or you have started a new company and you'd like to move that company into a more attractive position uh, in, in, in the industry hierarchy, right? You'd like to grow that company and move it up. Uh, um, well, performing well, performing well at, at the level you are at uh, is, is critically important. And, and performing well doesn't mean, uh, doesn't, uh, mean that you simply have to meet the expectation to you at any given level of, of uh, status. It means that you have to exceed it. So in some senses, it seems different today. Demonstrable success against expectations is the game to play. But there is another way, which is to gain status through your social connections. And this feels more like what was happening back in ancient Rome, where you demonstrated status through your wealth, your connections and the relationships that you had. And, and the reason why we are a little bit, um, perhaps a little bit leery about the, the second way is that, that sometimes that can be, you know, misused, right? <laughs> you might be an imposter, right? In the, in the sense that you, you're just really good at socializing and so on, but you are not really delivering at the level uh, you're socializing at. Or even more extreme, of course, you can simply be born into a set of social relationships that gives you a tremendous advantage in terms of access, but you don't you you haven't really managed to 
to so show that you can you can convert that initial benefit or advantage you have into to to superior performance so is status a gateway to fraud i've been watching the brilliant inventing anna series on netflix following the story of the new york socialite anna sorokin who fooled her way into new york society pretending to be a german heiress it's a very modern status story but one where perceived status enabled her to defraud businesses and friends alike this story surely highlights the shortcomings of status as a reliable heuristic a reliable metric of either good capability or of good character anna sorokin managed to hoodwink the best of new york's glitterati in part due to her exquisite dress sense and her knowledge of art and culture visual displays matter yeah so so status function you know through exclusivity right and this is this is this is a basic kind of observation and that's why i always uh, tell my student we are not all equal there's a difference between us not everybody is going to 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 reach the top uh, right and and as we move up in a hierarchy the way that the people then throughout history and and all cultures and and so on have have tried to mark themselves is to have more expensive um clothes more expensive watches bigger houses bigger cars and and so on and so forth so there's nothing there's nothing unique and modern in wanting to 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 show off it's 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 part of human evolution that that we do that so this is what connects the 21st century anna sorokin with the 1st century tremalkio both realize the value of showing off of visible displays of wealth and fortune and the social and economic benefits that accrue from this this is as we can now see both a very old and a very contemporary story in that respect for status to matter over time it needs to be linked to performance in some visible way this is why we are comfortable to pay our football stars many millions in wages while we are less happy with big salaries for bankers goals are countable whereas the collaborative enterprise of making money is less easily attributable to one individual i do think that the 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 humans are, are much more comfortable with inequality if it if there is a performance a uh, basis to it right but as humans have just as 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 i think humans care fundamentally about status and and it's it's good that we have hierarchies humans also care fundamentally about justice and we are uncomfortable when um inequality seems to be um uh, not based in a real performance difference but based on something that that is that is random or something that is perhaps uh, another source of of uh, of control simply power exercise of power you move into a position and then you do everything you can to monopolize that that position why then is visible wealth a measure of performance because it's unambiguous because it's it's really it's really interest it's really easy to to understand we've been focused on status in the west ancient rome and modern societies in europe and the americas but does status work differently in other cultures that that's a brilliant question and i think again it's the two answers to it so i think the basic processes are the same the basic need to form hierarchies to have some mobility in these hierarchies uh i i i fundamentally the same it's a human universal and we are all humans after all right um of course then the different dimensions on which hierarchies materialize themselves the the uh, the the cultural norms about how to compete within hierarchies and so on they vary a lot from 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 culture to to culture a final word from michael Has the role and power of status changed over the last 2000 years 
Or are we essentially playing the same status games as people would have been playing back then? The basic form is the same. And, and I think this, this is why social science is fantastic, right? Because we're trying to uncover these basic structures. And once we have an understanding of them, then we, we, we try to see how do they fit both across time and across culture. Um, so I think, you know, going back 2000 is, is, is going to be a, a huge stretch. So I'll, I'll, you know, say just the last uh, 20, 30 years with, with the advent of, of the internet and so on, things have changed dramatically in the in the way that status expresses itself so we suddenly see things like influencers uh, people understanding how to harvest and how to benefit from the dramatically uh, faster speed of information exchanges uh, through social media have created new status hierarchies that that didn't exist before where you know, teenage girls come in and they begin to build a following that uh, no queen or king had uh, 200 uh, years ago, right? 